Good morning, good morning. Today we're going to be in Daniel chapter 5, so if you have a Bible, you can open it up to that or scroll down to it. Daniel chapter 5. Actually, before we look into the text today, there's something I want to mention now uh, for the conclusion of the service, but um, as Pastor Phil was praying, uh, we want to uh, be a blessing to the Afghan church, and so in lieu of our regular deacon's offering that we give on the the first of the month. Uh, We're going to give it to the Afghan church this time through Operation Mobilization, giving practical aid to displaced peoples, refugee families, help for local churches and believers unable to leave, Bibles and literature and local languages to sustain believers, and support for radio, TV, and internet ministries reaching into Afghanistan. And so we're going to do a special offering at the conclusion of the service today. You'll see uh, some deacons at the doors on the way out, and um, you could just put, put your offering there. We'll, we'll put it all together and send that out through Operation Mobilization to, to bless our brothers and sisters over there in this hard time. We'll give you a reminder at the end of service, too, about that. Well, Daniel chapter 5 is where we are at. There's plenty of famous phrases we use in English that come from the Bible. For instance, by the skin of your teeth. Did you know that came from the Bible? Job chapter 19. A drop in the bucket, that came from the Bible, Isaiah chapter 40. To go the extra mile, that's Matthew 5. Bite the dust, that's Psalm chapter 72. Rise and shine, that's Isaiah 60. And then writing on the wall, the writings on the wall, that's from today's chapter, Daniel chapter 5. And we're going to see the story that surrounds that phrase, the writing on the wall. So let's get right into it. Today, first let me pause and pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for this time to study your word together as church family. But we do pray that your Holy Spirit would open up our eyes to truths that we need to hear this morning. We thank you that your word is truth and that you've preserved it for us. Uh, Lord, let it do its work in our lives today. That's our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, starting in verse 1 of Daniel chapter 5, says, Belshazzar, the king held a great feast for a thousand of his nobles, and he was drinking wine in the presence of the thousand. While he tasted the wine, Belshazzar gave orders to bring the gold and silver vessels which his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken out of the temple, which was in Jerusalem, so that the king and his nobles, his wives and his concubines, could drink out of them. Then they brought the gold vessels that had been taken out of the temple, the house of God which was in Jerusalem, And the king and his nobles, his wives, and his concubines drank out of them. They drank the wine and praised the gods of gold and silver, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone. All right, so Daniel 4, where we were last time, ended with King Nebuchadnezzar, the story of his humbling. And now we're just kind of casually talking about this king named Belshazzar, you know, just flip into the next chapter and boom, here's this other king. You might be wondering, well, what happened here? First thing you need to know is that the chapters of Daniel are not organized in chronological order. One through four are, but then it skips. If you were to go in chronological order, it would go seven, then eight, and then five, and then nine, and then six, and then 10 through 12. So it's kind of all jumbled up at the end there. Uh, But there there is a, a rhyme and reason to that, the first part of Daniel, actually the first half of Daniel is more historical narrative, whereas the second half is is prophetic, and so you'll you'll get more of that as we go along. But in this chapter, Daniel chapter 5, Nebuchadnezzar is actually dead. He's been dead after a reign of 44 years, and Daniel is no longer a young man. In this chapter, he's in his 80s, so picture an elderly gentleman. The events we read about today in Daniel 5 happen about 25 years after Nebuchadnezzar's humbling episode that we read about in Daniel 4. So here's a little rundown of the relevant history just to kind of give us a running start. Who is this Belshazzar? Uh, Well, directly after Nebuchadnezzar's death, which was in 562 BC, he had a son named, and this is not a joke, his name is actually Evil Merodach. (laughs) That's his name, Evil Merodach. He reigned for only two years. And then he was offed by his brother-in-law, whose name was Neroglisser. These are crazy names. He, in turn, reigned for only four years, and then he died. He died a natural death. And his son, Labashi Marduk, 
who was only just a child, ascended the throne, which is pretty amazing. Uh, but then he was beaten to death just a few weeks later. Man, these people are brutal, right? So we had Nebuchadnezzar, evil Merodach, Nereglosser, Labashi Marduk, and then one of the uh, assassins of that child then took the throne. His name was Nabonidus, and he actually happened to be one of the sons-in-law of Nebuchadnezzar, the first king. So his son-in-law, Nabonidus, takes the throne, and he has a son, Belshazzar, who we're reading about today, Nabonidus' son, co-reigning with him. So in other words, Belshazzar is the fifth king after Nebuchadnezzar. And uh, actually, history lends credence to this. The, the Bible is completely accurate in all that it portrays about history. This is an ancient cuneiform writing known as the Nabonidus Cylinder. It describes Belshazzar as a grandson of Nebuchadnezzar. There's been some quote-unquote scholars that would cast shade on that idea, but it's, it's verified in history. Bottom line, the whole bloody history of Babylon is all confirmed by archaeology. How the Bible presents is 100% accurate. And uh, in fact, in other places in Scripture, Jeremiah 27 even specifically predicts that Babylon would meet its end during the reign of Nebuchadnezzar's grandson, Belshazzar. So let's get back to our scene. That one was for all the history buffs and nerds out there looking at a, looking at a couple select friends here in the audience. Anyways, let's get back to our scene. This is a big party. It's a big party. Wine, women, wealth, it's all there. Belshazzar is kind of throwing this fiesta. And at this exact moment, however, the Persian army is surrounding the city of Babylon to conquer it. So picture this. This party's going on, and this army is surrounding it. It's mid-October, 539 B.C. Now the question is, well, why is he throwing a party when there's this army surrounding the city? Well, Belshazzar has a false confidence in the strength of his city. Miles and miles of high and thick walls and actually, I misspoke two weeks ago when I talked about the dimensions of Babylon, the, the walls. They're not 40 feet tall. They're 340 feet tall. So very tall walls, 80 feet thick. The horse chariots could race around on top of the, the walls. Today would be like a seven-lane highway in thickness. They're 56 miles long. So Belshazzar has this, this confidence in the city. They have this elaborate system of inner walls, moats, Gates made out of bronze that couldn't be burned down like wood. And so he said, okay, whatever. We've got an army laying siege to us. We'll be fine. The hall of this feast has actually been unearthed. Here's a, a picture a good friend of mine sent me. It measures 52 feet by 170 feet. That's like the entire main section of the White House in size. And so you can picture this scene in your mind. Picture a throne there and everything. This party going on right here. I think the first lesson that we can take from this, before we go any further, is that excessive confidence in natural defenses is dangerous. We see Belshazzar has this, this confidence in, in what he's got going on. We'll be fine. We don't have to worry. And I think sometimes we can do that same thing. We think we're safe, and then something happens. Something like a, a world-altering microscopic virus, right? Things happen in this world that change everything. Stock markets tank, Real estate plummets. You can lose your job. You can get a bad diagnosis. As Jesus said, moths and rust destroy. Thieves break in and steal. And so we put confidence in things of this world. The rug could be pulled out from under us just like that. And so Belshazzar, he has this false confidence. Uh, but perhaps he does see the threat. There is a possibility that he's just trying to distract himself. Why is he having this party? Maybe he wants to distract himself from his problems. And once again, that's something that we do today, this escapism. You know, there's a lot going on. It's troubling. So what do we do? Diversion, drinks, drugs, romance, adrenaline, anything that helps us ignore the pain and emptiness in the soul, difficulties in the family, in the world, etc. So we can kind of surmise what, what's going on here. Belshazzar, maybe he's got false confidence. Maybe he's just trying to escape his situation. But this party goes much further beyond foolish confidence or foolish escapism. It actually becomes a sacrilege. Look once more at the text and notice that Belshazzar asks for the vessels of the holy temple to be brought out so that he can use them to party with. 
These vessels would have been in the Holy Jewish Temple in Jerusalem that was sacked so many years before, brought out for profane and shameful use in this party. The Babylonians had looted Jerusalem, and they, they ransacked the temple. And uh, apparently, I, I think maybe Nebuchadnezzar, when he came to faith, when he was humbled, maybe he put these items away into storage. And so now Belshazzar is asking for them to be taken out. And once again, we're just trying to get into his head. What is he thinking? Why is he doing this? Perhaps he's thinking something like this. Sure, we got these Persians surrounding us, these, these pesky Persians. But you know what? We've conquered other nations before. We conquered Israel, right? He's, he's trying to flex here. Let, let's bring out the vessels of this conquered nation, and we'll party because we're not scared. We'll drink out of the cup of sacrifice. Let's flex. Well, this is a big mistake, as we'll see. Look at verse 5. Suddenly, the fingers of a human hand emerged and began writing opposite the lampstand on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the back of the hand that did the writing. Now imagine this. A human hand is writing something on the wall in the middle of this party. Maybe it took people a second to realize what they were seeing. But I imagine that the the sound of the party hall went deaf quiet, and you could hear the sound of a pin drop. This hand is appearing writing a message. What is it saying? And will Belshazzar listen to it? This hand is the hand of God writing on the wall. There are actually two other instances in Scripture where not God's hand, but his finger is mentioned as writing. In Exodus chapter 31, the two stone tablets of the law given on Mount Sinai were written by the finger of God, is what it says. And then in the New Testament, you recall the story of the woman caught in adultery. Jesus, uh, before he, he tells the people, whoever is without sin, cast the first stone. What does he do? He stoops down on the ground And he's writing on the ground uh, before he defends and pardons the woman caught in adultery. So the finger of God writing, the hand of God writing. God has something to say. Will Belshazzar listen to it? Isn't it also true in parallel that God, he still speaks. He still speaks. And the question is, well, are we going to listen? He doesn't just write a few words. He's given us a whole book full of words. We call it the Bible. Are we listening to what he's saying? So here we have the people, they're getting plastered. God writes a message on the plaster. Let's see what the message is. Verse 6. Then the king's face became pale, and his thoughts alarmed him. And his hip joints loosened, and his knees began knocking together. The king called aloud to bring in the sorcerers, the Chaldeans, and the diviners. The king began speaking and said to the wise men of Babylon, Anyone who can read this inscription and explain its interpretation to me shall be clothed with purple and have a necklace of gold around his neck, and have authority as third ruler in the kingdom. So I think this has got to be the fastest example of sobering up in history. He's drunk, and then he sees his handwriting on the wall, and then he, he sobers up. He could barely stand. It says his knees are knocking together. Literally, the text actually says his color changed, and the knots of his loins were loosened. I don't exactly know what that means, but that sounds pretty gross, right? Uh, He could make out the writing, but apparently not understand the message. Perhaps it was written in ancient Hebrew, that's why. Now, the, the, the Jews would adopt the Aramaic script in history during this Babylonian captivity, but before that, they had what's called a Paleo Hebrew script. So if it's written in Paleo Hebrew, then he, he could see the, the scratch marks on the wall, but not understand what it said. But more than just seeing the strange hand appear, I believe Belshazzar was dismayed because his conscience likely already troubled him. He sobered up. He was scared because of what he saw. But I believe he was also knowing that he was in the wrong because of his conscience. And many times God speaks that way. The voice of the Holy Spirit, you know, calling us to obey, to repent. Here we have this little tidbit. Anybody who can interpret this can be the third ruler in the kingdom. Once again, that confirms the historical accuracy Remember, Belshazzar was co-regent with his father, Nabonidus. So you have one, two, well, what's left? Third ruler is the next slot available. So he says, anybody who can interpret what this says, I'll make you third in command of the whole empire. Verse 8. Then all the king's wise men came in, but they could not read the inscription or make known its interpretation to the king. 
Then King Belshazzar was greatly alarmed. His face grew even more pale, and his nobles were perplexed. So we've seen this theme before, this motif uh, of the wise men coming in, and they can't interpret what's happening. This is like the fourth time that's happened in the book so far. Another epic fail for the pagan soothsayers in the book of Daniel. They didn't know the significance. They didn't know the application of this message. And then this happens, verse 10. The queen entered the banquet hall. Because of the words of the king and his nobles, the queen began to speak and said, O king, live forever. Do not let your thoughts alarm you or your face be pale. There is a man in your kingdom in whom is a spirit of the holy gods. And in the days of your father, illumination, insight, and wisdom like the wisdom of the gods were found in him. And King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father the king, appointed him chief of the soothsayer priests, sorcerers, Chaldeans, and diviners. This was because an extraordinary spirit, knowledge and insight, interpretation of dreams, explanation of riddles, and solving of difficult problems were found in this Daniel, whom the king named Belteshazzar. Let Daniel now be summoned, and he will declare the interpretation. So the queen comes out. This is likely not Belshazzar's wife or even Nabonidus' wife, but this was the queen mother, the wife of the late King Nebuchadnezzar. She comes out. Maybe she had too much class to be a part of this drunken party in the first place. But, but she comes into the hall, and she tells them, she tells Belshazzar, your father, but just a generic way to say forefather, your forefather, Nebuchadnezzar, knew a man who could help in this situation. She, she names Daniel. His prophetic gift was still the stuff of legend. She remembered because she was there when Daniel came through in past times. And so she, she brings up his name and Belshazzar calls him in. Verse 13. Then Daniel was brought in before the king. The king began speaking and said to Daniel, Are you that Daniel who is one of the exiles from Judah, whom my father the king brought from Judah? Now I've heard about you, that a spirit of the gods is in you, and that illumination, insight, and extraordinary wisdom have been found in you. Just now, the wise men and the sorcerers were brought in before me to read this inscription and make its interpretation known to me, but they could not declare the interpretation of the message. Now, I see in, in Belshazzar here, human nature here. You know, when things are going great, when the party's going as planned, you don't really care about what God has to say about something, right? When everything's good, who needs God or, or his message or his messengers? But when things fall apart, instantly, okay, back to God. His message, his messengers are acknowledged. And that's so like human nature. So now Belshazzar is in this place where all of his human resources are exhausted. Well, he goes to the last place. He goes to God's messenger, Daniel. So now old Daniel approaches the young king. Belshazzar continues on. But I personally have heard about you, that you are able to give interpretations and solve difficult problems. Now, if you are able to read the inscription and make its interpretation known to me, you will be clothed with purple and wear a necklace of gold around your neck, and you will have authority as a third ruler in the kingdom. So Belshazzar is offering Daniel worldly motivators, power, position, possessions, his angle is, you know, hey, Daniel, I've got some favors to ask of you, and if you can help me, well, I'll help you, buddy. I'll make it worth your while. Cha-ching, man. You're going to get a nice little outfit here, gold chain, power, all that. Well, I love Daniel's response here, verse 17. Then Daniel replied and said before the king, keep your gifts for yourself or give your rewards to somebody else. However, I will read the inscription to the king and make the interpretation known to him. I don't need anything from you. I don't need any of your possessions, your position, power. I don't need that. I work for God. And I think this is a powerful show of character on Daniel's behalf. He worked for God, not for gold. It was about God's glory, not his own. And so none of these temporary earthly rewards seemed to matter to him. What could someone give you that would matter more than your integrity? And Daniel understands that. Uh, Psalm 50, verse 10 through 12, says this, For every animal of the forest is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills. I know every bird of the mountains and everything that moves in the field is mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world is mine and everything it contains. 
So Daniel knows he serves the God who has everything at his disposal. And so why is he going to kowtow before this pagan king? He knows that he can't outgive God, so his motivation is simply to honor Yahweh. He doesn't need the bribes. He doesn't need the stuff. Now, I, I see in this a uh, tone much different than Daniel, his tone with Nebuchadnezzar. Now, he was very polite with Nebuchadnezzar. You know, oh, king, live forever. I wish that this, this message was for your enemies. Well, I think he's got a different relationship with Belshazzar because he gives it to him, served cold. <laughs> Anyways, this, this is what he says, verse 18. Oh, king, the most high God granted sovereignty, greatness, honor, and majesty to Nebuchadnezzar, your father. Now, because of the greatness which he granted him, all the people's nations and populations of all languages trembled and feared in his presence. Whomever he wished, he killed, and whomever he wished, he spared alive, and whomever he wished, he elevated, and whomever he wished, he humbled. But when his heart was arrogant and his spirit became so overbearing that he behaved presumptuously, he was deposed from his royal throne and his dignity was taken away from him. He was also driven away from mankind. And his heart was made like that of animals, and his dwelling place was with the wild donkeys. He was given grass to eat like cattle, and his body was drenched with the dew of heaven until he recognized that the Most High God is ruler over the realm of mankind, and that he sets over it whomever he wishes. So Daniel is telling Belshazzar this little history lesson that he should already know. It's Babylonian history uh, from his own family. He gives Belshazzar this lesson to learn from Nebuchadnezzar's story that we read all about last chapter in Daniel chapter 4. Belshazzar should have heeded this cautionary tale from his grandfather. Nebuchadnezzar was humbled. Remember last week, the, the mighty king was looking over his kingdom saying, well, I'm pretty awesome, right? God humbles him for seven years, and he becomes like a beast. He, he, he behaves like an ox in the field, eating grass. His hair grew. His nails grew. And then at the end of seven years, his reason returned to him, and he, and he said, you know what? God is the ruler. God is sovereign. He's in charge. After he humbled himself, he was exalted. So Belshazzar should have known this story, this history. He should have known better. If God had judged his predecessor, Nebuchadnezzar, why would he allow Belshazzar's own sin to go unpunished? But he doesn't heed the story. Verse 22, yet you, his son, Belshazzar have not humbled your heart, even though you knew all this. But you have risen up against the Lord of heaven, and they have brought the vessels of his house before you, and you and your nobles, your wives, and your concubines have been drinking wine out of them. And you have praised the gods of silver and gold, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which do not see, nor hear, nor understand. But the God in whose hands are your life, breath, and all your ways you have not glorified. So remember, Belshazzar was not... Nebuchadnezzar's son by genetics, but through royal succession. Uh, it's that generic term. There's a little phrase here that I thought was fascinating. It's, it jumped off the page at me. It says, The God in whose hand are your life breath and all your ways, you have not glorified. And first of all, I think that's kind of mild, right? He didn't glorify him. Well, yeah, he didn't glorify him. He brought out the vessels and committed sacrilege with them. This is foolhardy. This is blasphemous. He was insulting the Most High God. But the part of this phrase that really sticks out to me is when it talks about how his life breath was in God's hands. And that's true for all of us, the fact that God holds all of our breath in his hands. You know, this, this fragility of our life. Uh, we, we think we're strong, but really, we're not that strong. Uh, every breath, we depend on God to give us. Our lives are more fragile than we think. We ought not to presume upon the future. We don't know how much time we got. So let's use our breath to praise and honor God, the one who gave it to us. It's only appropriate. The breath of the creature should praise the creator. But Belshazzar was not doing that, much to the contrary. So now let's see what was actually written on the wall. Verse 24. Then the hand was sent from him, and this inscription was written out. Now this is the inscription that was written. Mene, mene, tekel, ufarsin. This is the interpretation of the message. Mene, God has numbered your kingdom and put an end to it. Tekel, you have been weighed on the scales and found deficient. Perez, your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and Persians. So four words were written on the wall. 
One word was repeated twice. And interestingly, they all happen to sound like monetary units of the day, like money of that time. Uh, there's mene, which sounds like the mina coin, but it means numbered. Then there's tekel, which sounds like shekel, and it means weighed. And then there's ufarsin, which means and divided or and halved, and that sounds like the, the coin of the half mina. And it also sounds like Farsi. You guys heard Farsi before? Farsi language? What, do you know where they speak Farsi? <laughs> Afghanistan, also in Iran, which was in ancient times known as Persia. Persia, Farsi. Uh, you can kind of see how all these things are related. So the message is numbered, numbered, weighed, and divided. So first, Belshazzar's number was counted twice, and he came up short. He came up lightweight. I like this. I had this on my shelf. I thought I'd bring it up. This little weight system here. There's this verse in Proverbs chapter 21. Proverbs 21 verse 2 it says, Every way of a man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the heart. And God measures fairly, properly, and accurately. I got these little uh, gold grams here. It's not real gold, but you know. So you put that in, and then you put in something heavier, and it goes boom, like that. And that's what's happening here. Belshazzar is being weighed, and he's coming up lightweight. He doesn't have the substance. God measures fairly, properly, and accurately, and Belshazzar's kingdom is completely devoid of moral value. And it's going to be destroyed. In fact, little does Belshazzar know that this little party he's been throwing is actually going to be his own funeral. You'll see very quickly how things turn in the story. That very night, those Persians surrounding, that encroaching enemy is going to absorb his kingdom into their larger domain. And so God is using Daniel to foretell the immediate takeover of Babylon by Cyrus the Persian. And it was fulfilled the very night it was spoken, mid-October 539 B.C. Listen to some of these other prophecies in Scripture that describe what this takeover looks like. Jeremiah chapter 50, verse 1 through 3 the word which the Lord spoke concerning Babylon, the land of the Chaldeans, through Jeremiah the prophet, says, Declare and proclaim among the nations. Proclaim it and lift up a flag. Do not conceal it. Say, Babylon has been captured. Bel has been put to shame. Marduk has been shattered. Her idols have been put to shame. Her images have been shattered. For a nation has come up against her from the north. It will make her land an object of horror, and there will be no inhabitant in it. Whether people or animals, they have wandered off. They have gone. I set a trap for you, and you were also caught, Babylon, while you yourself were not aware. You have been found and also seized because you have engaged in conflict with the Lord. So when Belshazzar brought out those, those vessels uh, to toast his false gods, that was an act of war against God from God's perspective. Later on in Jeremiah 51, verse 36 to 39, Therefore, this is what the Lord says, Behold, I'm going to plead your case and take vengeance for you, and I will dry up her sea and make her fountain dry. Babylon will become a heap of ruins, a haunt of jackals, an object of horror and hissing without inhabitants. They will roar together like young lions. They will growl like lion's cubs. When they become heated up, I will serve them their banquet and make them drunk so that they may rejoice in triumph and may sleep a perpetual sleep and not wake up, declares the Lord. There's so much colorful language in the prophets. But this very night, the Medes and the Persians, this, this joint force is going to come and conquer Babylon. In fact, with divine intervention as well as their own ingenuity, they can just walk right in. Those big gates that we we're talking about, they just go right under them. Uh, this is what the ancient historian Herodotus describes. He, he describes how this all goes down. So the Persian, the, the commander of the Persian army, his name is Cyrus. And this is what he says. Cyrus, on his way to Babylon, came to the banks of the Gindes, a stream which empties itself into the river Tigris. When Cyrus reached this stream, which could only be passed in boats, one of the sacred white horses accompanying his march, full of spirit and high metal, walked into the water and tried to cross by himself, but the current seized him, swept him along with it, and drowned him in its depths. So the Persians are on the way to Babylon, you know, they, they have their false gods or false beliefs as well. They go to this river, and one of their sacred horses, I imagine, 
you know, some, some kind of pagan thing, tries to go across the river by itself, it drowns. Now listen to what Cyrus does. Enraged at the insolence of the river, threatened so to break its strength that in future even women could cross it easily without wetting their knees. Accordingly, he put off for a time his attack on Babylon, and dividing his army into two parts, he marked out by roughs 180 trenches on each side of the Gindis River, leading off from it in all directions, and setting his army to dig, some on one side of the river, some on the other, he accomplished his threat by the aid of so great a number of hands, but not without losing thereby the whole summer season. So in other words, Cyrus throws this hissy fit because he lost one of his favorite horses, and he gets his whole army to spend an entire summer digging up some trenches so that the river could part and they could walk through it. Doesn't that sound crazy? He, he throws his hissy fit at the river, and he makes his men build this dam to divert its course. Now, that's important because of what happens later on. Later on, as he gets to Babylon and kind of struggles with how to conquer it, a light bulb goes off in his mind, and he remembers what he did earlier with that other river. Listen to this. This is still from that ancient historian Herodotus. Cyrus was now reduced to great perplexity. As time went on, and he made no progress against the place, meaning Babylon. In this distress, either someone made the suggestion to him, or he bethought himself of a plan which he proceeded to put in execution. And I'll show a little picture to help you picture this. He placed a portion of his army at the point where the river enters the city, and another body at the back of the place where it issues forth, with orders to march into the town by the bed of the stream as soon as the water became shallow enough he then himself drew off with the unwarlike portion of his host and made for the place where he dug the basin for the river, where he did exactly what she had done formerly. He turned the Euphrates by a canal into the basin, which was then a marsh on which the river sank to such an extent that the natural bed of the stream became fordable. So in other words, he diverts the course of this river Euphrates that went right into the city of Babylon the water started to go down and down, and once it got shallow enough, boom, they just walked right in underneath the gates. Isn't that, isn't that amazing? He goes on to say, Hereupon the Persians who had been left for the purpose at Babylon by the riverside entered the stream, which had now sunk so as to reach about midway up a man's thigh, and thus got into the town. Had the Babylonians been apprised of what Cyrus was about, or had they noticed their danger, they would never have allowed the Persians to enter the city, but would have destroyed them utterly. For they would have made fast all the street gates which gave access to the river, and mounting upon the walls along both sides of the stream would so have caught the enemy, as it were, in a trap. But, as it was, the Persians came upon them by surprise, and so took the city. Owing to the vast size of the place, the inhabitants of the central parts, long after the outer portions of the town were taken, knew nothing of what had chanced. But as they were enraged in a festival, sound familiar? continued dancing and reveling until they learnt about the capture. Such then were the circumstances of the first taking of Babylon. So once again, we have extra biblical evidence just supporting what the Bible says happened. They're having this drunken party. The Persians divert the course of the river, come right under and kill everybody. They dammed the river upstream, waded in under the gates. Babylonians were caught totally off guard. And Daniel's prophecy is coming true from chapter 2. Remember? The head of gold gives way to the arms and chest of silver. Babylon is giving way to the medial Persian Empire. This is what the Old Testament scholar Lehman Strauss said. He said, Empires do not stand by human might, man-made machines and missiles. There is not a wall high enough nor thick enough to prevent a nation from falling when God pronounces that nation's doom. And so doom was pronounced. And it's, it's happening. So how does Belshazzar respond to this message? Verse 29. Then Belshazzar gave orders, and they clothed Daniel with purple and put a necklace of gold around his neck and issued a proclamation concerning him that he now had authority as the third ruler in the kingdom. So I'm just picturing Daniel. He didn't, he didn't even want this stuff to begin with. They're trying to put this around his shoulders, put this around his neck, give him a promotion. It's short-lived. This is the last night that Babylon exists. Now, it's hard to tell whether or not Belshazzar really believed Daniel. He gives him this, this promotion, short-lived, certainly. Daniel is actually going to survive this all. 
and even emerged triumphant as as an administrative official in the Persian Empire later on. So he survives this whole transition from Babylon to Persia. God preserves him through the whole thing. Look at verse 30 and 31 to finish off the chapter. That same night, Belshazzar, the Chaldean king, was killed. So Darius the Mede received the kingdom at about the age of 62. So God's plan of the age continues. He weighs the nation of Babylon. They're found wanting. They lack moral virtue. And they get wiped out onto the next earthly kingdom of Persia. But God, he weighs these nations. Uh, He continues to do so. Kingdoms, rulers, individuals, he weighs. Revelation 18 talks about a future Babylon that will be judged by our holy God. The evil world system will meet its end completely at that point. But getting back into our, our day, our modern day, God weighs and judges nations now the same way. He weighs us and he sees if we're, we're following him or not. Do we come up lightweight? And oftentimes we do. Listen to what Charles Spurgeon said. Remember, he's a preacher from England, but he's preaching this in 1859, talking about the United States of America at the start of the Civil War. Listen to what Charles Spurgeon said. He said, There's no God in heaven if the iniquity of slavery go unpunished. There's no God existing in heaven above if the cry of the Negro do not bring down a red hail of blood upon the nation that still holds the black man in slavery. Nor is there a God anywhere if the nations of Europe that still oppress each other and are oppressed by tyrants, do not find out to their dismay that he executes vengeance. The Lord God is the avenger of everyone that is oppressed and the executor of everyone that oppresseth. And that that great sin of slavery in our nation's past was surely judged. I mean, look at the numbers, the Civil War, how many people lost their lives? They estimate between 600 and 700,000 people died as a result of that conflict. And we still feel the aftershock of that whole conflict in our nation. Now, it's easy to view that as a dark period from a distance, you know. But also today, how would God measure our nation right now? If you were to look at the United States, how would he measure us on his scales? And just one example, actually recently, if you've been following the news, there's this law in Texas that was held up that abortions are illegal after six weeks. Praise God for that, right? Amen? Amen. I think it's great that uh, that went to the Supreme Court and actually uh, they, they did nothing about it, meaning that that law is still in effect in Texas. Hopefully that trend continues in other states. But right now, the United States, we have more radical abortion laws than pretty much anywhere else in the whole world, even Europe. In most of our states, you could have an abortion at any stage in the pregnancy for any reason. More than 61 million unborn children have died as a result of that Supreme Court decision in 1973, Roe v. Wade. So when we think about our nation right now, as God weighs us, uh, sometimes we think we're doing all right. I don't think so. I don't think so. Uh, I think we need to be cautious about where we're headed as a nation, where we've been. We need to hold up for truth and pray for our country. Uh, Because if God has righteous weights, well, then where would we be with something like this on our hands? So God be merciful to us. Our nation is not much different than Babylon. Sensual, gluttonous, provocative, sacrilegious, blasphemous, unholy. I see a lot of parallels. In the end, our nation isn't much different than Babylon. And so uh, we should pray for our nation, continue to pray for our nation, especially in these dark days that we're in. Now, God weighs nations but he also weighs individuals. So as we wrap this up, I want to bring it all the way in. On an individual level, the truth is that God weighs us all. We come up lightweight. All of us come up short on the scale. Here's how Romans 3, 23 puts it. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We're all lacking, but we can have what we need in Christ. This is the good news of the gospel. We don't have what it takes but our Savior Jesus does. He died on the cross for our sins. He rose from the grave on the third day, and he's made a way for us. When we put our trust in him, God takes the righteousness of Christ and puts it over on our side of the scale. 
And that way, we measure up. We don't measure up, but God has provided through his son so that we might, through faith in Jesus Christ. And so, as we close today, would you trust in him today for your eternal salvation? Maybe you've been trusting in, in yourself. You'll come up light. Trust in Jesus Christ, the only one who will make you measure up before a holy God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we see this chapter, it's, uh, it's easy to distance ourselves uh, from what's happening here, the judgment of Babylon, an empire that existed millennia ago. But Father, as we see things more clearly, we realize that really all nations don't measure up, and certainly our nation, uh, for all of, its, all of its greatness, Lord, we don't measure up either. We need your son, Jesus Christ. We need the pardon that he offers through his substitutionary death on the cross. Father, we need your Holy Spirit to fill our lives, to fill our hearts, to make an impact in this nation. Lord, we don't look forward to judgment, but we know that in some form we're experiencing it already. Ultimately, Lord, you will take care of your people. You'll preserve a remnant. You always do. And Father, one day, uh, the world system will completely be judged and you will reign forever. We look forward to that day, Lord, that your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Father, we, we do pray for our nation that you would turn hearts, Lord, start a revival in our very town, in our state, Lord, we ask, we plead that your spirit would work, that people would respond to the message of the gospel, the only thing that can heal our wounds and forgive us of our sins. Father, if there's anybody uh, hearing this message who has not made a decision to follow you, now is the time. They can talk directly to you, perhaps praying something like this in their heart. Heavenly Father, I know that I've sinned against you. I fall short. I don't measure up. But I believe that in your great love, you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for my sins. And I believe that he rose on the third day, conquering sin and death forever. And I receive that free gift of salvation that he offers. My, my debt is paid. I trust in him as Lord and Savior. Father, now as we take the elements of communion, we just want to say thank you for that great gift. As we take inventory of our lives, if there's ways that we have not been measuring up, Lord, we repent of those now and trust in your awesome love, your forgiving grace. We think about our Savior now as we take communion together. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.